All right, welcome to OK Computer. I am Dan Nathan. I am joined by Trevor Marshall. He is the CTO and co-founder at Current and a contributor to OK Computer. Uh, Trevor, welcome back. Thank you for having me again. Well, you know, you say having me. Uh, you are my landlord here. So I, I, uh, I office here um, in uh, Chelsea, uh, in Current's uh, global headquarters here. Um, so I do see you over at the water cooler every so often. But, you know, you and I have been chit-chatting a lot since... Um, you know, you were last on in late February. Um, you know, we're talking about Gen AI. We're talking about how you're thinking about it as it relates to your own fintech business. Um, you know, all of the hype in the private and the public markets in and around that seems to be somewhat disconnected from some of the other things that we're seeing in both the public and private tech markets um, and away from generative AI. It seems like that's something that, you know, most investors are focused on yet. Like at this moment, it seems like there's a lot of interesting things going on in fintech. The last time you were here, we talked about um, a huge proposed merger um, in the con consumer finance space. Um, so let's kind of hit on some of those topics here. We're also going to talk about the the Bitcoin halvening. Is it the halvening or the halving? What, I, what do we call I, it? Yeah, halvening sounds great. Yeah, I think it's having. It's yeah. having. But yeah. you've heard people say that. Oh, yeah. That, well, yeah. The, the flipping yeah. when so yeah, Ethereum will take oh, over. that was pretty cool. Oh, that that never one. happened, did it? No. What was the what was the tightest ratio it ever got to? I don't, it did I get don't at some point, right? It was close. But it was the Web3 stuff that yeah. was push, pushing Ethereum, right, mm -hmm. in that direction. I actually would love to get your take on that, so we'll do a little bit um, of that also. And we got to talk about this humane uh, AI pin because it sounds like you have like two of them on you right now. Uh, yeah. no, no, you don't. Okay, that, that, <laughs> I mean the Freaked viewer me can out. tell that you do not have that. That's next um, level AI. Well, let, let, let's quickly start here. Um, let's talk about the, the the stock market here. You know, at one point the S and P was up nearly ten percent. The Nasdaq was up a little less than that. We've been talking about on all of our pods over the last call it six to nine months. You know, there's been this tremendous um, you know, reliance on some of the biggest names in the market that really had a really good gen AI story. And they were just kind of keeping the markets um, afloat. Some of that stuff has gone sideways a little bit. You know, Microsoft is consolidated. Um, NVIDIA, these are two of the biggest beneficiaries, if you think about it. Both of them gained more than a trillion dollars in market cap since gen AI become a big part of the story here. But they've gone sideways here. So as we get into... Q1 earnings season in earnest here, it, it'll be really interesting to see what the forward guidance looks like, what the commercialization of some of these products looks like. A, a company like NVIDIA, where we know that they had all of the supply and, and 200, 300% of the demand, right? You know what I mean? That sort of thing. So curious, um, as you're like thinking about this, you've been around fintech for a long time. Uh, you obviously have paid very close attention um, to what's going on in the broader tech landscape. Where do you think we are? Just a little bit of a vibe check here um, on the excitement in and around generative AI. Let's start in the public markets, and then maybe we'll take you to the private markets. Yeah, so vibe check on on uh, Gen AI. I mean, it's the the um, weighing machine taking over. Yeah. Of like, okay, show me the show me the results. Yeah. Um, just speaking from the way that we're using it, in terms of Gen AI, that's pretty much only in some um, customer service yeah. automation right now. But I think there's a lot of promise there, and, and we're starting to build that those capabilities out a lot further. Um, we haven't seen that exact type of technology really flow into the rest of the business. Just out of like, well, we're trying to operate in the best way possible. We're using a lot of machine learning and like GCP products to yeah. do. Um, you know, model training and and, and sort of operationalization and, and things like that. So the whole data infrastructure, mi like machine learning uh, technology space, mm -hmm. super valuable to the business, adding adding a tremendous amount of um, sort of expansion and what we can do and and the cost that it takes us to do it. Gen AI, it, you know, customer service, yeah, preserving context right in, a, in, a, in but, a conversation. But so, so let's back this out for a second. So if you think about, again, a company like um, NVIDIA, right, to train tr those large language models, you needed these high-end GPUs, right? Yeah. And then they go into these supercomputers and data centers and the cost of compute is really high and everyone's talking about, okay, well, maybe they're all trained up and now we get to the inference phase. And that's really what you're talking about, right? Like your usage of those models as it relates to customer service. Isn't that correct? Yeah, we're, and, we're and not, you're using it largely through Google Cloud for the most part. Using correct? it through Google Cloud, using it through other um, providers that yeah. sell the service. Um, and it is all inference. We're not paying for any training. Um, they're, they're, I'm sure they're doing a bunch of training on their end, but even then, a lot of these... I mean, like the LLMs, they're not trained by startups. They're not trained by, you know, folks like us. Yes. 
um, they might be tuned or 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 um, you know given instructions, guidance, uh, if you will. But um, you know the we're not bearing the cost of sort of everything you know that a lot of the big cloud providers are using. All right, but here's a good example. Okay, so let's just say you know you've been testing um, a, a lot of these um, offerings, okay, um, and you're trying to integrate them into your products and services. You're trying to gain productivity, right, mm -hmm. and and reduce cost, and you know. While these companies have been training these models and buying these GPUs and building out these data centers, right, the cost to you has probably been, you know, kind of expensive to, to some degree, I, I'm assuming, right? Like they're trying to pass, but no, no. It's you're, actually, you're I mean, for, for example, um, in the uh, chatbot in particular, we were using sort of a very rule-based, um, hey, you know, if the customer asks right. about this, then say this. If they ask about that, mm -hmm. then say that. Um, and the switch over... There, there is not a tremendous incremental cost. It's very, but you're modest. seeing a much better result. Is that is that, that the, that's the idea? Yeah. We're still testing our way yeah. into it um, because and you're running them side by side right yeah, now. We, yeah, we yeah, and so and 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 measuring things like um, customer satisfaction, resolution rates, um, right. like really just measuring it. Um, so like we'll we'll see how how that that all all pans out. But we're um, we're not seeing major like we're not taking on the cost of that and in, in right. theory if it works better it lowers costs so Correct. um like a lot of this stuff to the consumer should be somewhat deflationary um and so yeah exactly it's like where where does the where does the money go to and so you know there's headlines out there but okay well maybe we need different foundational models maybe we do yeah right and to me that is um similar to what we saw honestly in like um 2021 ish of uh, fintech where a lot of money, venture capital coming into the space. Sometimes there is uh, more opportunity than there is need. Mm -hmm. And as a result, new business models can form. And so it's a way of like hyper, you know, hyper um, uh, motivating growth yeah. into certain areas is through that capital allocation. Um, but I'm not sure if it's coming from a real need for it. Yeah. All right. So, so let me ask you this though. Let's just say you're doing all this testing side by side with your existing chat bot. And let's just say incrementally, you're not seeing that much you know, greater of a performance standpoint. And let's say the cost is just incrementally a little bit higher. You will basically dial back that spend. Is that fair to say? And you'll continue to kind of work with what you're, you know, have been doing until something better comes out. I guess the thing that I'm trying to bring it back to the public markets in a way is that like, if there's a bunch of companies like you who don't, if it's not head and shoulders above what you've already been doing and it costs more, then you're going to dial back that spend. And then the companies that are training these foundational models are going to be dialed dialing back their demand for GPUs. And then you're going to have a company like NVIDIA, which has basically seen massive deceleration after a crazy acceleration in demand. And they're going to start guiding lower. And companies like Microsoft, which have gained a trillion dollars in market cap in six months because of the thought that they're going to be able to be offering these higher touch products and services backed by this open AI technology and Copilot and all this stuff, if they can't monetize it, right? So do you see where I'm going with this in a way? So I'm just curious because I know you know, you are in the CTO set here as far as fintech is concerned. I'm sure you talk to a lot of your peers. Um, I'm just saying, how optimistic are you that you're going to see, you know, somewhat like immediate, when I say immediate in the next six to 12 months, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like incremental, like productivity gains that justify, let's say, whatever increased spend that you're doing. Yeah. In order to increase spend, like we can't, we have to be able to reduce costs somewhere else. That's yes. just that's the environment win, but it's also just good, with the vendor good though. Can I ask you a question? Because that's the other thing is like if Microsoft's trying to jam down this copilot per seat in your firm, you know, in your yeah. company, like aren't you like isn't it gonna steal from Peter to pay Paul? It's not like are you gonna pay like they announced their pricing yeah. on it, but you're gonna reduce the cost of some other service that they're offering you. The I mean, it's not that it's unspoken because I think it's covered quite a lot, yeah. but it's reducing headcount mm -hmm. primarily of like if you can get some who can do the work of 10 people yep. and you can pay a machine you know for one person correct it that's 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 where the theoretical cost saving well, well, comes here's, from but here's another way to think about it okay yeah. so tesla just announced 10 percent of their 140,000 global workforce uh, you know reduction okay so think about that like you know if those per people are not on the, like the assembly line and I, i'm assuming a lot of those people are you know what i mean but like let's assume there's 5,000 you know, like licenses to, you know, maybe, you know, 
you tell me on average how many employees, how many licenses do you have mm-hmm. for like SaaS software and stuff like that. Like, you know, if that's what we're getting into, if we're going to get into like some job cutting sort of phase because of this productivity gains, I think it's like a weird cycle that could exist. Does that make sense in a way? Yeah. Is like the companies selling this new advanced tech are going to see less demand for a whole host of other products, especially if it's putting people out of business. Yeah, like customers. Less, less licenses. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I, I think there's definitely something there. It should be deflationary. Like it right. should... Ultimately, like one, the reason I don't see like that immediate inflection, I think we'll, we'll get a lot of the benefit in customer service. But the reason I don't, I, I don't think people have just figured out how to apply it yet. Like I haven't yeah. figured out or, or seen ways to like increase developer velocity through mm-hmm. this stuff yet because the problem space and, and the types of problems that we're solving, like most of the engineering we do is, is far more architectural than it is just like banging out a ton of code. Yeah. Um, so you just mentioned something really interesting on the investor front because you remember the, the the period where you know like the VC community was tripping over each other. Any consumer facing fintech app, you know, this is just you know the yeah. last few years or so. And there was an article in the Information, I think it was last week or so, and the, and the investors sitting out the latest AI wave so far. Here was a quote from one investor. This was from Paul Madera at Meritech. We have a lot to be more careful of. He added that in some cases, the business traction is a mirage. We're seeing a massive experimentation period here that can give you the head fake that a startup has a real business. I thought that was kind of an interesting. Here's from Lawrence Tosi. He's the former CFO of Airbnb. We're not seeing traditional growth equity go into the big pure AI company plays. The financials, business models, and valuations seem uh, hard to analyze at an early stage. So when you see those sorts of quotes, so so these are you know some big VC firms are sitting yeah. this out, and I think it was interesting also that I think you and I have spent some time talking about this. It's a lot of these um, strategic investors, right, that have been pouring money into o- uh, Anthropic and Cohere and OpenAI, yeah. and the list goes on and on. So, so talk to me a little bit about that dynamic, that traditional, let's say the sort of folks that were investing in fintech a few years ago are sitting out this Gen AI wave, and it's all about the strategics. Yeah, I mean, the uh, like, I do think that, I, I mean, I agree with like the Madeira qu- quote, mm-hmm. um, that you want to see the actual business traction, mm-hmm. um, but you can miss out on a lot of hype like gains like we both have been around crypto long enough to know that those are that's a real way to like make money yeah um but if you're taking a longer term view like for me i want to see i just it's not totally clear yet how i'm going to apply the technology at current except for like customer service is very clear and there's probably going to be some other things that become very clear as more examples come out and I'm just not being like a lot of middle office it. like processes and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. Um, it's not totally obvious. But yeah, I do think like it is a little bit hard to analyze. Like it is a little bit, um, you know, where, what does this turn into? Because there is a difference between like the way that the software is delivered because there's such that there's that huge upfront cost on training. And then there's a very low productionization cost, um, from inferencing. So I think these are, this is a, probably just a new type of business model. Like, what does it even look like if you are a foundational model developer? What is your long-term business model? Like, mm-hmm. what it actually is OpenAI's longer-term business yeah. model outside of something that looks more like consulting work? Well, it, well, it, is it, it's licensing fees, right? Like, so, so for instance, and, and we'll talk about Apple in a second here, you know, Apple is down, you know, a whole heck of a lot from its recent highs, massively underperforming the S&P and the NASDAQ, and they don't have, they never built their own model, right? So they don't have that to kind of, you know, you, you know, put across iCloud or whatever other services that they're using that are customer facing. They don't have something that can go on their iPhone. And they basically, there were rumors a couple, I think a few weeks ago that they are talking to, uh, you know, uh, Alphabet, Gemini, Google, um, and talking about licensing that or open AI and even like, like Baidu in China, which is like, seemed bizarre to me. Like they're really scrambling for this sort of thing. So it seems like a licensing thing. I know that like open AI, they want a search engine. They want to do a whole host. Yeah. Of I mean, licensing, I, I just, I struggle with that a little bit because the mathematical techniques are not going to be something that can be preserved mm-hmm. super well, even with like the strictest trademark, copyright, IP, best lawyers in the world. It's just going to be hard because those are ultimately a- almost academic mm-hmm. um, uh, things that that information will become available. And ultimately, the ones that will have the best models are the ones that have the best data. Um, and it's going to be, well, what are the partnerships? What's the pipeline right. for that data? What's the licensing around the data and the access and ownership? 
around that, which is why I still think Google's probably best positioned. All right, let's, let's talk about yeah. that. They had their big cloud event, I, I want to say a week and a half ago or so. And, you know, at least market participants and then many tech reviewers, like people that, you know, that are opining on this stuff all the time, they walked away um, incrementally more positive than they had been. You know, if you think about in 2023, you know, after OpenAI kind of like kind of stole the show, the initial Bard launch, the Gemini launch, there was just kind of like falling on their faces a little bit and the stock had been underperforming. They had a couple of quarters in a row, I think it was kind of Q3 and Q4 that were disappointing in their core business, you know, yeah. and you could make an argument that, you know, search is going to be disrupted, their traditional ad. You talk about data, you know, like there's not a better repository of the mm -hmm. data than Google. So a lot of folks thought they should be in the catbird seat, right? Like to kind of develop this model and have it at least as good as what OpenAI was able to do. What were your, what, what are your thoughts in general? And you and I have talked about Google from a sentiment standpoint, it's kind of kind of gone up and down. Down, it looks like it did a turn after you know this event a week and a half ago. The stock made a new all-time high um, as the Nasdaq was trading at all-time highs. Um, thoughts on Google because right now, yeah. at least in the investment community, um, it's still a little bit downbeat. The sentiment. Yeah, I mean, go back since when we started talking about this. I don't know, maybe six months ago. Mm -hmm. It's the first time we talked on this podcast mm -hmm. about that. And I've been saying since the beginning that it's going to be like probably Google. And it's kind of going to be Google or Amazon or it's going to be who's going to deliver the last mile mm -hmm. of this stuff. And, and you know, the cloud providers ultimately have the best infrastructure for how to deliver the last mile for software. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll either, you know, like the, the academic techniques are, are not going to be things that are super well preserved, which is why you're always going to see a headline saying that X new model beats uh, chat GPT on taking a, a you know a math test or mm -hmm. there's just going to be constant because there's just going to be improvements of technique that are made available and so it's not going to be it's ultimately like okay the bar is always going to keep getting raised and sure one like Gemini might be six months behind but they're mm -hmm. not going to be five years behind yeah. they're not going to be ten years behind yeah. um, and so okay well then what's the data and what's the oper how do you sell it and so. Through, through a cloud provider, you can actually really well instrument that into clients mm -hmm. who are going to pay you for it because you have all of the infrastructure set up on from connectivity, mm -hmm. billing, the whole thing, like just literally the, the, the fiber of delivering information from one place to another is owned by Google, yeah. right? Like, and they, they've actually managed that. So I think like it's, it's like it's this massive verticalization of, of, of software and, and model delivery. Google's invested in this more than anyone else mm -hmm. when it comes to their Vertex AI stack and mm -hmm. with their sort of just their model infrastructure. So do you think people are underappreciating that relative to what the consumer product yes, absolutely. Like, is looking like? Absolutely. Because, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Because like at if if they want to really scale it, it's not going to be through a, a chat subscription. Yeah. It's going to be through companies paying a hundred thousand dollars a month yeah. to to generate, you know, seven hundred thousand dollars of savings. Yeah. That's that's where the just you know and that was a big focus of yeah. this Google event that that yeah. took place next uh, yeah. yeah so so and again I think that's probably the thing that a lot of technologists have, have known and maybe the investment community um, is starting to figure out another good example of this you know uh, uh, Meta is building this llama model mm -hmm. right and so. I guess if you look at just how the stock has been performing, what they have been saying about this, how they're using it internally to better monetize, you know what I mean? Like their traffic for ads and, and all this stuff. I mean, their production stuff is and, working, by the way. And it's working. Yeah. I mean, the stock just, you know, it's it's yeah. at uh, you know all time highs or just yeah. just off of it, um, if you will. So that's a good example of a company that's harnessed their own technology to benefit mm -hmm. their own business. And which brings me now to Apple. Okay, so here's a company that has, um, you know, they've never exactly been the, 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 at the forefront, you know what I mean, of like a technological shift, but they've actually just, done, when you think about, you know, um, you know, uh, the iPod, then you think about the iPhone, then you think about tablets, right? And and and, and then, you know, some wearables, if, if you will, you know, that sort of thing. And they perfect them. And then they have a 2 billion installed base right now, right? And they have all the gross margin in the hardware business for all intents and purposes, at least the smartphone business, right? Um, but they're starting to lose share. China's a little bit of an issue. Um, you know, Samsung's out there who just retook um, market share globally um, over Apple of high-end smartphones. And Samsung's advertising this AI phone, so on device, okay? Apple's got nothing. Right, they, they they literally have not even been talking about generative AI all of last year when all of their major competitors, like at least the large platform companies, have. 
So you think about this, June 10th, Worldwide Developers Forum, they usually announce their new, or they always announce their new iOS, and then it rolls out with the new device in the fall. So again, I just mentioned this, the rumors were that they were talking to OpenAI, they were talking to you know Gemini. It would probably make sense for Google, they have this search deal uh, on the iOS devices to do something there. When you think about Apple, um, how do you think of this integration between hardware and software and how important is it that they don't have their own model like some of these other big platform companies? Again, Amazon doesn't. You know, they've invested in Anthropic and, and, and the like here. Is that important to you like as you think about Apple going forward? I don't think it's important to own the model yeah. um, because the cost of inference is so low. Mm -hmm. I think there's a reason why Apple hasn't built their own search um, and it's a smart reason, <laughs> which is like that's not their specialty. Their specialty is hardware and and actually i mean they, the software on devices is great it's like it is you think when i think of apple and what their strong suit is it's the combination of hardware and software but it's people always that point that to siri and they say well siri is supposed to be like an ai device for all intents and purposes right ish you know what i mean like i think um there was a there was a moment right and this was really kicked off by alexa where we just developed the voice interface mm -hmm. and there was a lot of oh like grandeur around what the voice interface could mean and I, I would say for the most part, if you go back to a lot of the original excitement, mm -hmm. the promise has been fulfilled there. And it doesn't matter if you're using Google's or, 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 or Siri or Alexa, they all fulfill the basic needs of like, I need a voice interface to do the stuff on my phone. I think that what we're talking about now is, is like a um, sort of like outsourced knowledge work, um, which is reasoning, deduction, something that goes beyond mm -hmm. a simple, and I say simple, but like goes beyond a Google search which is not a simple thing, but it is a, like I ask for something, I get it back. It is more in the space of predicting what you need and how you need it. So I think Google, even though it's a very, very small part of their business, mm -hmm. they've started putting, the, so they developed the the these tensor chips. So mm -hmm. things that are specifically designed to do um, inference mm -hmm. and, and, and like, you know, on device mm -hmm. learning and um, inferencing on, on, on different models. Um, they, they from the beginning like if you if if you're if you use Android or if you're using a, a Pixel like it does predictions around what are you likely which app are you likely to to open next what settings are you going to use inside of here um, what's the right filter to put on this picture because like you know where I saw it show up in consumer is you know I have a Pixel. Mm -hmm. Um, and everyone around me <laughs> has an iPhone, but oftentimes they're You're like, the oh. green guy. You're the <laughs> but, green guy. <laughs> but oftentimes people are like, oh, can we use your camera, right? And it's because like- They're they, so much better. Why have they yeah, always been so much better? Because of the software. Always and, though? Like, I, th I think you can make all sorts of arguments so around like that. why has an Apple, you know, in, in my iPhone, yeah. there are Samsung, you know what I mean, yeah. components. Why have they, I've been at concerts, okay, sitting right <laughs> next to a guy, you know, with a Pixel uh, or a Samsung Galaxy, right? And we take a picture of Bono and we're sitting, sitting right next to each other. And his, you could blow up and put on the wall and it would look like a piece of art. Yeah. And mine looks grainy and crappy. And that's been going on for as long as I've had an iPhone. And I've always flirted with getting a Samsung, but I hate Android. Yeah. But talk to me, like that is a software thing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they uh, it's incredible what they're able to manipulate with on device. Like every every picture has just the right level of tuning. Mm -hmm. um, and so like that was an investment that they made early on. And it's something that Apple probably goes towards, mm -hmm. um, but they don't need to have the model. There's there's no need for, I, I don't think they need to go and develop their own thing. If anything, the only reason to do it is to, you know, uh, for valuation, right. if that's what's being you know, uh, sort of credited right now, but I, I don't think it's important. What, what does Apple need to do, right? So everybody around you uses an iPhone, right? Yeah. And so soon, you know, we're all going to be looking at our one weird friend who's the green guy in the group chat, okay? And we're like, and you're going to be talking about all these whiz bang features that you're using AI on on, on device, and, this, and we're all going to want it, right? What do they need to do? Um, is not going to be on the iPhone that's released in September. Like, think about that. There's nothing that they can do right now other than put a software wrapper, right? Like, like could they put, um, you know, you can already go to the App Store and get Chat GPT 4. You can already go get Perplexity, which is a wrapper, and you can choose any, you know, model that you want to do. Um, is that enough right now? I mean, just to be able to say, well, the, like, the, we have faster, better chips that integrate well, and our software integration is better, and go ahead and choose whatever app you want to use. Yeah, I, I don't think consumers care that much. I mean, they'll be like, oh, that camera's better or, you know, the app's better. Like, it's still the case that Apple has the tightest, best ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's really e intuitive to use. I think they have 
a lot of moat that they've built up from mm -hmm. a brand and ecosystem sort of perspective. So I, I'm not, I think the, the reason the market is worried about it is just because it seems that everyone has their own model. So why don't you have one Apple? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that in the long term that is going to make that much difference. I think the techniques will become public. There's already a lot of open source models if they wanted to run their own. Mm -hmm. I don't think they need to. I think the costs come down sufficiently. And do you think we're years away? So it sounds like you think we're years away from consumers really being able to recognize what the benefits of generative AI on a device are right now. I don't because think it's a lot years. Of it is, yeah, yeah, I don't think it's years. But I think it'll be at the software level. Mm -hmm. It'll be like, oh, wow, Gmail knew that I should start writing this email. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've already, you've already seen it, like the autocomplete stuff that mm -hmm. Google's had for a long time. And that was the genesis of a lot of the research in terms of predicting what's the next thing based on what you've said before. Um, I think people will start seeing it in that things are eerie. Like um, it's already eerie that you talk about something and then you see an ad for it on Instagram. Um, it, there's just... And, and that is probably just based on certain signals that you're doing and that, that you didn't even know were signals to say that you were interested in this razor blade or something like that. And, uh, you know, it's um, that's just going to be the way that I think most people experience it is that, wow, that was eerie. And then we'll just accept that that's how that works. All right. So do you think that um, businesses are likely to recognize the benefits long before consumers ever will? And then thus consumers will, will recognize that hopefully you just mentioned it's a deflationary force. So like if a company like yours is able to bring down a lot of costs, you should be able to pass through some of that to your consumer and lesser fee, uh, fees or, or, yeah. or whatever. Does that At the sense? margin, right? Like we're a company of 170 people mm -hmm. and we've got nearly 5 million members, right? Mm -hmm. And we're, we're so like already the, 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 the deflationary yeah. force, yeah. you know, we're adding 100,000 accounts a month. Like the deflationary force just exists from the product. Like there's very little gen AI in, in the product today. Yeah. So- it, it's at the margin for sure. Like our contribution margin will be better. We'll be a more, you know, like the the economic, like the business will be better. Yeah. So from that extent, but I think when you look at the bigger picture, there is a the the deflationary force is just being able to offer uh, services digitally, twenty four seven to meet the consumer demand without needing people to serve those services, yeah. and that doesn't require Gen AI, but it should it should like push it along. All right, let's talk about this uh, humane AI pin. Um, and so this was released, um, you know, this company has raised a lot of money, I think over $200 million in, in VC capital. Um, it's basically gotten absolutely panned. Um, I know that a lot of folks were kind of excited about it. So this is an AI device that you wear on your body. The whole idea is to have less reliance on your smartphone, right? It's doing a whole host of things that you might've done on your smartphone by just observing and being with you in the moment. Moment, there's this like thing that kind of zooms like something Star Trek-y on your hand and you yeah. can see something or whatever, um, you know, very prominent, um, you know, uh, online reviewer, uh, Marques Brownlee, just what, what do you call it? The worst device he's ever reviewed. I watched that review. Like that you did? It okay. Was, so, yeah. so talk right. to me. Is reviewer. this like, you know, like, listen, um, you know, I remember 10 or 12 years ago when Google introduced, you know, Google Glass. And this was meant to be like, a, a, you know, an augmented reality sort of thing. It was never meant to be like a virtual reality thing. And at the time, it was kind of cool for a moment. It kind of felt very similar to the excitement in and around Vision Pro, right? That kind of died. That's been only a couple months or so. Um, you as like, as somebody in the technology space, you're an early adopter also. This is obviously meant to be... A consumer product right now, but I'm sure there's plenty of enterprise applications. I'm sure in a few years from now, there's going to be devices very similar to this, right, that are really doing lots of cool stuff. Yeah. How much emphasis do you put on some of these early cracks at a device like this? I actually, I think it's pretty exciting. I wouldn't have bought one even if I hadn't seen that review, yeah. um, just because it's like pretty early. And if you think about like, what are the different modalities of tech that have actually stuck? There's obviously the smartphone and mm -hmm. nothing has really unseated that. But I actually think that Alexa had a pretty good stab at it in mm -hmm. terms of creating this integrated speaker that could give you more information. And that's shown up now just in like, you know, Sonos in mm -hmm. in um, in the Google uh, sort of like hubs so yeah. that they have Google Homes. Yep. Um, and I, I think that that was pretty interesting and that kind of stuck around more than a lot of people thought it would like hey this kind of looks like a fad so we'll see i don't think it's going to be this iteration um it does seem like you know i i, I think it's really cool just to have different types of interactive models mm -hmm. 
Like I think that little screen thing is the one of the coolest things just from yeah. like a nerdy perspective. Yeah. It's just a totally different take, even if it's not very good. Yeah. I like the idea of like, okay, is it like a hologram? This, is that basically what it is? It's basically like, it's just a laser projector that can then very easily sense. Like I love the the physicality of it. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's, it's cool. Like I, I'm like, I'm kind of with, uh, you know, when I watched this review, I, I really agreed. I, I like that, that people are taking stabs at it. It's very rare to see like this net new attempt at sort of a different foundational model for interaction f with technology. Um, I don't think that, particular version is going to do well maybe maybe if they've raised a lot of money they can iterate on it a lot the the promise of having a screenless sort of assistant is a intriguing one i you know i like the idea of that i'm kind of i think a lot of people are a little bit sick of you know having the phone and, and being so chained to that and so the concepts away from that are are just intriguing from a consumer standpoint so I don't know. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I tried to get the the new um, Ultra, the the Apple I you know watch Ultra, and the idea was get it hooked up to a cellular you know network and just like leave my phone. Oh, and it just doesn't work that well. You know, yeah. a lot of these things are just really inconvenient. It's going to take a while to really kind of break the habits that we have with a smartphone and go back and try to find your first iPhone. You know, like um, you know, it's amazing. Like you know, how small it was, how little it did, you know what I mean? Yeah. And we have become really reliant on it. And think about this is like when I'm at home, I'm rarely using my laptop unless I'm trying to look at a big fact totally. screen or something totally. like that. So, um, you know, the phone, I, I'm not sure we're ever going to replace that if you think about it. Yeah, it'll probably change. I think it'd be interesting if they can get it so that there's no screen needed, whatever. Yeah. I don't know what that looks like, but, and you know, there's some of those concepts with, you know, the wearables. Yeah. It, it feels like it, it'll happen in the next five to 10 years. It'll, we'll have a different foundational like yeah. interaction. But you know what's interesting? You know what's a good guide for this? Because I think the, the, the geniuses that make Black Mirror, and I hadn't seen the last season, which came out maybe a year or two ago, but it seems like for years, all those near future, you know, sort of episodes that they have, you know, and most of them are, there's always a screen. Like, think about it. There's always still a screen. It might just be a piece of glass or something like or that. Or contact. Yeah. Or, yeah, well, yeah, that, that uh, one. Was, yeah. 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 But there, there's always a screen. And that's yeah. why I thought, you know, um, the most unobtrusive sort of thing you could do. In hindsight, when you look at Google Glass, you know, it could, can't do anything relative to what Vision Pro can. Mm -hmm. I just don't see a world where the Vision Pro is a widely adopted device in its current form factor and mm -hmm. and you know Tim Cook and the way the folks at Apple talk about it is ultimately going to be a laptop replacement you know what I mean so I'm just not sure that ever happens but again whatever um, let's talk a little bit and this going back to let's just say public markets whether you can call crypto a public market you it can feels, now it feels kind of public because <laughs> you got the spot Bitcoin ETFs okay yeah. so the last time you and I talked about it, at least fe February the anticipation of those ETFs coming it was driving up the price and if you think about it you know you're gonna make a, a product like that and it's gonna be based on the spot price you need to own the spot right and there was a whole host of really big companies and fidelity and you know a whole host of uh, um, really good trusted financial services companies that were introducing these products so you had this big run-up it was anticipated um it's been really volatile you know and and again this is at a time where interest rates have been going higher the dollar's been going higher uh, inflation readings have going higher so for one of the main pillars let's say just say a bitcoin in particular was that it was going to be this inflation hedge okay well that's kind of worked, you know, in that regard. It's a scarce asset, so we're going to talk about the having uh, in, in a second here. Um, but some of the other pillars of the old bill, uh, you know, bull case are not that great. So, like for instance, this past weekend when Iran is attacking Israel, you know, there's very few markets that trade 24/7. You know, crypto is one of them, and it got nailed. You know what I mean? So it was one of the few risk assets that's trading like around the clock, and folks sold it. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Now. True believers were probably buying it on that dip if you thought that any geopolitical dust up in the Middle East is going to be inflationary, then you want to buy Bitcoin again, right? Like, so I'm just curious, how are you thinking about it right now? What is like the best, and before we get to having, what is the best bull case for Bitcoin right now? Because it's hanging out, you know, above 60,000 right now, and it was trading, what, below 30,000 uh, a handful of months ago. I think it's still a dollar like an anti-dollar yeah um like in terms of a bull case but the dollar's going up exactly i mean like but it is yeah i mean 
in the longer term. I know, and I know and you the, guys and, have and a so, bunch of, it's yeah. about fiat. It's about yeah. like the debasing of the purchasing yeah, power exactly. and everything. And, and, I, and, and I get and if that. Because if you, because I am not trading this on, I'm not look. I'm looking at it a lot yeah. just because I, I like yeah. to follow it, but I'm not trading it on like the semi, like less in a less than a year time frame. Yeah. And so when when you ask me on on the bull case, I, that I go back to the default of okay, well, this is something that is an escape valve from the way that things work, and I think it's it's healthy to have that type of escape valve, just to have something that's fundamentally outside of the system, because everything else that's in the system is kind of tied to the dollar. Yeah. What if there's some like you're into sci-fi and you're in all this stuff? You know, when the machines scorch <laughs> the sun and we don't have any electricity, I, I Bitcoin don't. not to to and and then that AGI is going to take all your Bitcoin. That's the it's, other thing. Escape, you're not even to see yeah. it go away. Escape valve from the U.S. dollar is not escape valve from civilization. Yeah, okay, <laughs> like, fair enough. Like, so nothing is going to be not, particularly I'm not, useful. I'm not. Everything else is tied to the dollar, and this is something that isn't. I mean, gold isn't either. I think there's a good reason why gold's trading the way it is as well. You and I uh, always get a little weird towards the end of our podcast. We do. <laughs> we get we get to something supernatural. I didn't even walk or... you through the mechanics of having it. No, no. <laughs> but I, I. But but again, I've I've long thought that I was like, you know, um, the idea, like, you know, in the apocalypse, Bitcoin's not going to be t particularly too useful. And yeah. then, and, and 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 then, if we just want to go in like Terminator terms, like Skynet is going to get your Bitcoin. Like, mm -hmm. trust me. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, like, so unless you had kind of journaled it over somewhere where you just owned a whole shitload of water and canned food, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, not going to be particularly useful. Just yeah. saying, okay. Yeah. All right, let's let's talk about the happening, not yeah. the happening. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the happening. So this was to happen soon. Okay, yeah. so the block rewards for mining a Bitcoin mm -hmm. they get cut in half. All right, mm -hmm. explain to the listener who may not be, um, you know, so fluid uh, in the ways of Bitcoin uh, and the scarcity of it, but it yeah. just makes it uh, that much more valuable. Right? Yeah. So. Um, Every 10 minutes or so, uh, the transactions that are being submitted, so if I want to send you Bitcoin, you want to send someone else Bitcoin, they get collected. And every 10 minutes or so, a miner finds effectively the answer to a puzzle that allows them to create this block of transactions. And it collects all the transactions and it publishes it referencing the previous block, which is why it's called a blockchain. And it writes into sort of this immutable history these are the transactions that have happened. And it's done in a random way so that you can't have one person who's creating the ledger for everyone else. That's why it's called a distributed ledger. You know, everyone has a fair chance by running this lottery to be the person that writes history. And th there's all sorts of mechanics that are in place, but the idea from the beginning was there's only ever going to be 21 million um, Bitcoin that are created through these blocks. Every block that's created gets a reward. And it also gets um, transaction fees that were paid inside of um, inside of the transactions in that block, um, and they designed it in such a way that you know every two hundred and ten thousand blocks, um, which is like I guess one one hundredth of like you know there's going to be a hundred halves. I think that's what it is. Hundred halves. Um, uh, will the the reward will cut in half. With the premise, honestly, of that the value of this over time will increase, so there, st there will st still be incentive, but it's a way to then prevent infinite inflation. And so that at the end, there's just this fixed number of Bitcoin that exists, and it, it sort of limits out around 2044 is when the, 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 the rewards end, and is replaced by the transaction fees. So there's still an incentive. And so every time you submit a transaction, you also have to submit some money to be included within the block. There's a, a bunch of things that drive what goes into that, but... What's interesting is some of that's actually starting to play out, which is at least 10% of what a, a miner makes is transaction fees now. It's been as high as 40% recently. And over time with this halving, that percentage is gonna increase. And so there's gonna be this handover of, in the beginning, we're gonna seed the network. Why has there been volatility in the fees like from 10% to 40? Like, like Just depends on um, what's going on. Uh, it's not, it's actually, it's on the, what is going, it's on the data side. So if there's a spike in need, so there's a lot of what's called like layer two or like, you know, hey, we wanna create like uh, uh, networks that exist outside of Bitcoin, but use Bitcoin as a consensus mechanism to sort of check in, let's say, like you and I do a whole bunch of stuff and instead of putting all that stuff into the blockchain, we're just going to put a receipt. Here's the, the total balance of what we've done. That's effectively like you know, a very uh, dumbed down version of, of, of what's driving a lot of the data usage in Bitcoin in particular. Um, and so those the, you know, sometimes there can be really popular things that 
hey, we want to submit a lot of transactions. Now you need to pay a little bit more to be included because you want to have confirmations. You know, every 10 minutes, uh, you get a, a put into a block. And the more blocks you have, the less likely it is that someone can rewrite history. Um, so yeah, I, like what I'm looking at when as we're coming into the halving, I'm looking at the difficulty rate, which is how hard is that puzzle to solve? This is all time highs. I'm looking at hash rate, which is basically how much energy is being used. And I'm looking at block reward per block in dollar terms. And in dollar terms, it's at all time highs. So when this thing halves, I don't expect um, miners to turn off. I expect there's been a lot of cushion from this recent price run. They, they, you know, the there will continue to be probably increased investment as there has been since the beginning of this thing into, um, into mining capacity. Let me ask you this: So Nvidia um, was a beneficiary of the kind of mining craze going back five years ago. Yeah. Um, and and again, are these the same sort of GPUs that are being used? Um, Nvidia you know, doesn't mine? really participate in Bitcoin in particular because that moved a long time ago to. Uh, ASIC, so application okay, specific right. integrated chips, yep. and where those chips, all they do is run the Bitcoin yeah. uh, algorithm. Yeah, like, so and they're all they're doing is producing do hashes. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and yeah. let, me, let me ask you this. And so, another question. So, you know, we had this move from 40,000 or just below 40,000. I misspoke before saying below 30,000. This was late January, and it just literally skipped up 10 grand. It went in, in three weeks in, yeah. in the month of February from 30. Or forty to fifty thousand, and then in the month of March it went from fifty to sixty, and then you know straight to seventy, yeah. you know something or whatever. So here we are, we're back at like sixty-two thousand or something. So knowing that the halving is happening, okay, there's nothing that can change that, correct? No, like, that's okay. It, yeah. So that's happening. You'd have to um, fork, which if, isn't going to happen. If, if and this is not a recommendation, mm -hmm. okay, but like someone like you, you're probably always looking for opportunities to buy it. You're a long-term. I am. You're, yeah. Okay, so you're always. So do you want to see it go to fifty thousand? Like, like, do you want to see it even overshoot to back to forty thousand because you have this long term? Yeah, relief? I would. I would buy it there. You would. I would buy it there. Okay. But I, I've been sort of buying the whole way. Yeah. Um, up and a little down. bit, up and down. I think I've net lost money for the most part. Really? Yeah. I'm. A, and you're I'm like, somebody who's been in. You have literally yeah. been doing this for a very long time. Yeah. Right? Um, I think like uh, I am early to bottoms, late to tops. I just, it's just like uh, because I, I know like so, over time. I'm sure I'll be I'll be positive, and and I was able in particular with like Ethereum, I was able to play that myself like better than I've played Bitcoin. Yeah, for example. All right, so can, can we yeah. talk about Ethereum for a second here before we get out of here? So um, again, there was always this kind of what, what do they call the relationship or the mm -hmm. the, the ratio of yeah. Bitcoin dominance, you know, Bitcoin dom dominance, Bitcoin dominance. Okay. Yeah. So right mm -hmm. now, you know, I'm looking at my screens. Bitcoin is one point two three four trillion, and Ethereum is three six seven. Uh, 100 billion okay mm -hmm. so let, let's just call it it's a third of bitcoin here yeah and it seems like at least so again we started with a vibe check um on generative ai let's end with a vibe check on crypto i mean this is a real like like x out a bunch of these like tether and and bnb mm -hmm. and you know what i mean like yeah. these, these stable coins i mean you have nearly you know um a yeah, 1.75 trillion you know what i mean in actual coins that 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 uh, and i'm not calling them currencies but if you yeah. you know um that you know supposedly have some use or some scarcity or some you know yeah. store value or something like that i mean it feels pretty real right now. And you don't have all the laser eyes on social media. You don't have all the NFT bullshit. Or has that come back, a lot of that sort of stuff? Or is it just, you know Not I mean? really. So so talk to me about that. Like, where have all those people gone? And now who are the new purveyors of this thing? And a lot of it, I know, is also very locked up, right? Like, there's a disproportionate amount of Bitcoin that the whales own, and it never trades, right? Yeah. Um, there's, there's still p people building a lot of stuff. I would say, like, the, the highest level in terms of um, what people are thinking about is, well, like this run up in Bitcoin has been from the UTF. Like it's it's pretty clear. Yeah. Um, and so people are thinking, well, what comes next? Um, that's that's and that's driving. It's just you, that's not a hype driving thing. That's like working through the SEC and yeah. working like that's not a that's not a hype thing. It's just like, OK, how long is it going to take for BlackRock to figure it out? Right. <laughs> Because yeah. like it, this is the most successful ETF launch ever. Why wouldn't you want to go and try to bring some of these other things yeah. which have similar to uh, you know trades to market? There's still like a lot of stuff happening in these spaces. I think like um, there's I've 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 seen like 
some pretty interesting white papers for um, applications on even like Binance. There's a lot of int- there's a, a huge community with Solana yeah. still that's that's sort of going and developing. There's there's also like in this last run up, you always do get some fun like meme coins and things like that, mm-hmm. which are just sort of culture. Yeah. Um. And and it's it's like just internet culture. That seems like such bullshit though, because yeah. I was checking a lot of that stuff out in 2021. Yeah. And and I you know I was generally trying to be somewhat optimistic about it, but um, you know, um, it just seemed like there was a bunch of goofballs playing. It's just goofballs playing. Goofballs, at goofballs playing. Yeah, yeah, but playing at something that. Yeah. that a lot of people lost a lot of money. I mean, like, that's just a matter of fact. And some of the smartest people out there, and I don't mean that they were scammers, but they were thinking about this, understanding the technology, understanding the psychology of crowds, understanding, you know what I mean, that interest rates were at zero and mm-hmm. people were looking for this sort of stuff, understanding that people were locked at home and looking for culture and yeah, creating yeah. reasons to do that yeah. sort of stuff. I mean, listen, you remember, I had a, a crypto dick butt, um, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I still went, do. Went to zero. Well, I do too. I, hands. But I just can't get into my whatever. Uh, my MetaMask. I have no idea. <laughs> like, and so I have a bunch of crap that's just lost forever. Um, yeah. So for whatever that's worth. All right. Well, listen, it was fun to listen. I am, I've always been going back to 2017. Um, I've always been really curious uh, about Bitcoin. I'm always, you know, it's, it's a, a, a financial asset that is meant to do something. Um, I would love to know. I know that you know who Satoshi Nakamoto is. I'd love for you to whisper <laughs> that in my ear at some point because um, it, it is an ingenious device, whether it has any value or not. That's like yet to be, you know what I mean? Like, determined, but it really is. I mean, it's really thoughtful. Like in your lifetime, can, can you come up with something as thoughtful as this, as, it's, as it's, complicated as, you know? It's pretty well thought out. Yeah. And it is actually pretty simple. Yeah, actually, like, which which um, probably in your mind makes it just perfect. Like, yeah, right, exactly. It's like it, it, yeah. it's um, and it's one of those things where it's with some very limited exceptions. It is as it's always been yeah. um, in terms of the what we get is what we were promised. Um, and it was sort of instructed in code. And it's almost like religious in a yeah. sense of like, you know, this is an answer to a lot of questions that people have that are more existential yeah. um, than than they usually encounter. Well, so, you, listen, you yeah. heard it here first that, you know, if you're you're hoping that your Bitcoin saves you as we near the apocalypse, um, Skynet's going to take it from you. You're not even going to see it ever <laughs> again. So good luck on that. All right, Trevor Marshall, we covered a lot of ground here. I really appreciate you joining me again. We um, really got into it, man. You know what I mean? At some point, we'll do like a UFO. We'll do like oh, some sort of end of the world sort of thing. Um, so much to say. I know, I know you have a lot to say. I really appreciate you being here. I look forward to it again. Yeah, thank right, you. See ya.